Hi there, welcome back. And the uh, BFO saga continues. As you recall, if you've seen the last video, I built the uh, through-hole version. Huh, still got quite a few boards. And I've got to admit, personally, this is my favorite. But that is me. Um, I had an aversion to SMD component builds. I overcame that aversion mainly because of Mr. Carlson's lab. Watched a few of his videos and I saw how easy it was for him to work with SMD. Personally, I was a little bit skeptical, but I decided to give it a try. And since then, it's been a while now, I'm actually more inclined to go for SMD if I'm building something just a prototype with because I really, really like it. And I like it so much that um, I designed two boards for this. I wanted to be fair. I know that a lot of you prefer the uh, through hole. So in that case, this is the board. By the way, I have made a couple of corrections on here uh, that um, I mentioned in the last video. And the boards that, or the Gerbers that I'm gonna make available are for the corrected version, okay? This one, I think is gonna be my personal use version. I've got about 10 boards of these. As I've said before, these are from PCB Way. They're sponsoring this video as well. And I can highly recommend the boards because the quality on this thing is astounding. It is really, really good. And I went a bit further with this one, as you may have noticed. This bias pot here, it says bias two, and over here it says bias one. I've actually used SMD trim pots to do the first bias function of the first transistor, which is a uh, SOT23. Uh, it's a 2N3904 uh, SMD version. They're very cheap, very easily, to easy, easily available, and that one as well. But I also decided to put a, a trim pot to improve the bias on the second transistor as well. So I bought these two. I've never used these trim pots SMD versions, so it'll be interesting to see how they work. Everything else is pretty standard. The uh, F, uh, FTs, the um, IF transformers, are exactly the same ones that I used in the last build. The trimmers, or the tune pots, and the level pot are actually from Borns, and they are very small, and they actually fit perfectly on this particular layout. So I'm going to do this thing rather quickly. I'm going to just get all the components, start soldering, and I'll be showing you uh, possibly an intermediate step, and then we'll see the final result. Who knows? Maybe I'll convert you to an smd -er. huh. Yeah. Now, I wanted to save you the boredom of watching me sold all these SMD parts, so I decided to just basically skim through that. <laughs> a lot of wasted video, but uh, never mind. I just think it's um, not a particularly good how to sold SMD lesson. There are a lot of really good ones out there. But um, the secret is, take it one step at a time. I've prepared the components beforehand, uh, on some masking tape, one side is the sticky side up and the writing one is sticky side down. So I can just pick it out of the uh, tape and put it into the respective spots. I normally just dab a little bit of solder on one of the connection points, one of the uh, pin points, and then the, uh, the component is stuck on there. Then I do the other side. You know, you've probably seen that before. It's just a matter of being very, very careful. Most of these components are not... Um, polarized, so you can just put them in any way, like capacitors and resistors. Where you do have polarized ones, just be careful. You can use uh, either the markings on there. Sometimes the markings are a little bit of a challenge to see, so use a multimeter to check diode polarities and so on. But the result is, it's all there. It comes out really, really well, as you, I'm sure you'll agree. The uh, board is cleaned with some isopropyl alcohol to get rid of uh, any flux residue. Flux, by the way, which I used quite abundantly. It helps tremendously with the uh, solderability of the boards. The boards have worked out very well. They solder very well. What I normally do is I use a very hot iron. I, I set the iron at about 400 degrees. That's centigrade or Celsius. 
and I use a very fine tip. Now because it's a very fine tip, that's why the temperature is usually a bit higher. Because you really, in most of these cases, you're just touching the tip to the solder point. But the result is there. Um, it's all in place. There are There is one component on the underside. It's one resistor and the rest are all on the top side of the board. Here we are. It's done. And I put in the knobs and, and well, align them properly. This is important. You'll see why in a second. And everything <laughs> looks good. We'll see if it works. Now, a few pointers. Before putting in these bias trim pots, which are not 10 turn, by the way, they're single turn pots. I preset the uh, respective uh, resistances, in other words, the top half and the bottom half, as I would want them to be in the circuit. Now from the schematic, you'll see that the bias two pot is the one very similar to the one I used in the previous build. It's just a 47K resistor and I want 15 below and 20, uh, 33 above or so. So I've set that as more or less the setting that I wanted. The other one, I just added a 20, uh, what is this, 25K pot. Instead of having a big resistor on the top, I added a 25K pot so I can make it lower and higher. There's a resistance series as well, as you'll see from the schematic. It just allows me to change the bias point a little bit. I'm not sure if that's going to make much of a difference, but it's also preset so that the total resistance of that line corresponds to the, um, to the value that I have in the schematic. Other than that, well, yeah, the same uh, headers as I used before. This is a preset. I've actually got the uh, socket in there or the plug in there to preset it to low setting. I am waffling and I should just go ahead and test it because I have not powered this up. I wanted to see what the chances were of uh, building an oscillator, switching it on, having it work. I'm not too optimistic. These things sometimes go wrong. We'll see. So, as usual, I've got this for the power and make sure I get that the right way around. And I've got this one here for the output. And the one thing I remembered, I noticed, is that in the previous build, the RF out is the top pin and ground is the bottom pin. In this one, I realized I put it the other way around because I want to ground closer to that plane. So the bottom one is the output, not the top one. But anyway, I'll put the, this um, plug in here and we can use the, uh, the fly leads that come out. So the white one is the signal. Okay, so here we are once again, deja vu. I've got 12 volts coming out here. I've got a 50 milliamp current limit. Make sure the polarity is right. Yep, I've got the scope connected to the output and put it on. And nothing happens. Oh dear. Oh, the level. The level is down. It's down to zero. And we've got our usual. whoop de doo isn't that a surprise? We've got our uh, clipped waveform at about 440 kilohertz. Obviously that's not set yet. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust that trim pot that's bias 2, which is bias of uh, Q2, which is the one that I had on the previous version. Mm, not as pretty. Not as clean as the other one was. Let's try it again. This thing is only a one turn pot, so it's cutting. Okay. But it's supposed to be a lot lower. It's supposed to be sort of one volt, isn't it? If I recall. What happens if. No, it's not working. That is as clean as it gets. Let me try the other trimmer. Well, let's see what... That's just the level. 
that is the amplitude, or rather the trimmer. It's working, but let me try the other one. Oh. Okay, maybe maybe that's what it needed. This is now the um, trim pot bias one. That's looking better, isn't it? Try go to the first one again. Okay. Yeah, that looks good. Ha! Huh, that looks good. That's one volt. That's what we had before, and the the way I cleaned up that. Um, wave was with that bias one pot so the bias of q1 now remember these are smd transistors they're not the same as the ones i used i used uh, 2n2222s this is 3904s so this is probably why but that looks like a damn good wave look at that one volt and the level works very nicely yeah perfect perfect and I can trim it. I notice the frequency I think is changing. There's a slight change in amplitude with the frequency change. That's not too surprising because I've got, I think the effect of that could be, well it's affecting the oscillation, the actual oscillation. It's got to do with the feedback. Mm. But what do I get? I get from 850 to one volt to back to 960 on the low end. That's not really a problem. I don't recall having this problem or this characteristic with the other version. But the, the wave looks perfect. It looks bloody perfect. Now what I need to do is I need to adjust the uh, frequency and see what kind of span we've got because these uh, this uh, Varacta diode I'm using is completely different to the other one. Let me do that. So I've now got uh, the scope probe connected to here and the frequency counter connected to here. And the frequency counter tells us 445. So let me adjust this guy. 450. I'm going to leave it at 460 and see what the span is. Well, 460.3. That guy is on max. So 456.3, 460.3. I got four kilohertz exactly. Oh, that's brilliant. That's four kilohertz. That's two either side. So let me take this up. It's at the top. Let me take it up to 462. Wrong way. If I can set it up to 462, that means the other one should be 458. Yeah, how accurate do you want to get? Very. That's 462. And the other way, eh, 2.1 that way. I can actually make it, if I can make it 0.95, geez, I'm being stupid. All right, that's 2.04 one way, 2.07 the other way. That, my friends, is it. That's very accurate. That is very accurate. And the wave is still perfect. I can see it at the top now. Why did I say I wanted to get this thing calibrated, as it were? Well, if this is 462, and I'm touching it, so it's sort of gone up a bit. And that'll be just 458.03. Okay, this is 458. Top end is 462. Logically, halfway should be 460. It's not, it's 461. And this has to do with the uh, non-linearity of, uh, of the diode, of the Vericap diode. But I figured what I want here, this is lower voltage, right? So as I do this, I'm increasing the voltage. So I want the voltage there 
Whatever voltage this pot is producing at that point, I want it to produce it at this point. So I can get 460. And the way to do that is to use an old trick, which is to turn a linear pot into a log pot. If you take a pot like this one, this particular one is 50k. Now it's not too critical. I know that in my uh, through hole one I used uh, 25k, I think it was. Um, but if I want to make a linear pot log, logarithmic, if I take a resistor at about a tenth of the value of the linear pot and I put it across the ground pin, the zero or the one pin, and the wiper, it sort of makes it logarithmic. Now there's a lot of it on the web, you can read it up. The best uh, description I've read is actually on um, Elliott Sound Products. If you look for Elliott Sound Products and look at his website, you'll find that description. However, that's log, and I don't necessarily want it to be log. In fact, I don't even really want to know what function this is. I just want to make sure that I get that there. And the way to do this, and I did this with my other one, and you'll, if you look at the new boards, the, the actual boards, the actual Gerbers that I've uploaded, there's a space for a resistor between the uh, pin 1 and pin 2 of the pot. And the way I do this is I connect a uh, potentiometer between pin 1 and pin, and pin 2, and acting as a variable resistor, I start very, very high. This is a 50k pot, I can get a 100k uh, pot and use it as a very resistant and start with 100k between 1 and 2. And as I reduce that, I will see it start affecting the potential potentiometer effect of this pot. And I can set it to exactly 460 and then measure what resistance it was that I had there. So let me show you. So here I've got a 100k pot. Put it on max. It's on max. It's wired as a variable resistor. So there's my one and two. That one's not used. So at the moment, that's 100k or so. I've got it wired across. It's a bit precarious. I should have soldered something on here. But I've got it with this thing on vertical. I've got it to the middle pin and to ground, which is the other side. Now, I need to start rotating this guy till I get exactly 460. See, it's working. And that is 460. Now put that aside. And it's pretty stable. And it will be stable once it's set. Now, if I change this. Yeah, that's 460. So I can go to the top. I should still get my same range. And I go to the bottom. And I should still get my same range because all it's done is it's changed the uh, transfer function of that potentiometer. Now I'm going to measure what this uh, pot comes out to. Now without touching the setting of that potentiometer, I measure that and I get 8.7k. So probably it's not a really good value, is it? 8.7. I've got 8.2 and I've got uh, 10. So let me try this. Let me set it at 8.2. Oh, this is very, very sensitive. You know what? 8.2 is going to do. 8.2 is going to be fine because this thing is really sensitive. And then I'm going to put an 8.2k resistor between the uh, pin 1 and 2 of that pot and we'll go and check it again. I'll be using a, uh, probably a, wire, uh, a normal leaded component just for testing to see if it works. I've got that 8.2k resistor just tagged on there. This is our minimum. Now let me see where 460 is. Uh, yeah, well, that's not bad, is it? Let me put this right in front of the camera. See, that's pretty much spot on. 460. So it's made this lower section a lot slower, more linear. In fact, it's sort of adjusting a lot slower like it is on the top section. Because before, you would be at the bottom at 458, you'd just twist a little bit and you're already at 460. 
So it didn't really give you much spread here to adjust it exactly. So now you can adjust it a lot better. Brilliant, I like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove that resistor and these, this spacing here is as near as damn it, the spacing for a, an SMD uh, resistor. I'm going to put an 8.2K resistor in there. And on the boards that uh, I'm going to publish the Gerbers for and uh, upload, I will be putting that resistor in the, uh, in the board. So what will happen is you'll be able to put it, use it or not. It's, it's an option. But if you want to, it'll be on the board, probably on the underside. Why not? I mean, there's an underside resistor here. This is a dual-sided board anyway. So that's what I'm doing next. 457.8 or 9, 462. whatever. There's the middle. That is near as damn it. 460. It's staying there. It's just slightly to the right, but it's as near as damn it. That is still what we want. If anything, it's gone a bit more to that side. In fact, what I can do is I can actually just adjust this to 460, slap bang in the middle, see what happens to the ends. Oh, wrong way, I think. Nope. Okay, that's in the middle. That's 462.1. 458.95. That is bloody good. There we go. Ha! Brilliant. Okay. Our BFO is done, and I've improved the linearity of the um, of the tuning of the uh, diode. Now, can I state categorically that these component values are going to be fine? No. And the reason is that diode, that very capped diode is the one that I've listed in the schematic, but it could be different for you. I mean, you can literally just get a different diode, different range, and this thing might all not work out. So you have to be uh, basically willing to do a bit of a test run like this or get someone to set it up for you. And the first thing you'd set up is you'd set up your biasing, make sure you've got a nice sine wave on there, and then you adjust your frequency and then you can play around with that um, linearizing linearizing resistor yeah that's pretty good that's pretty good yep yeah. and um, if you want to you don't need to but if you don't then the lower end in other words the lower sideband if you want to do that look at it that way is it lower sideband yeah or is it the upper works the other way around doesn't it anyway when you're trying to tune down here you'll very, very quickly get to 460 and then you'll go over 460, whereas the top end will give you more span. This way, you're basically making the span equal. It's more gentle in its increase. But this thing is neat. Do you agree? I mean, look at this. This is bloody brilliant. It's small, it's compact, it's robust. You know, don't sit on it, don't drive a car over it, but it's pretty robust. And it, it is neat, and, and these things last a long time. The boards are great. The component uh, selection I've made here, they're all C0G capacitors. So they're all temperature insensitive capacitors. Uh, they cost a little bit more, but no big deal. The bias there is an option. As I said before, if you wanted to, you could just use fixed resistors, but I like the, the uh, possibility of adjusting. You probably will need to adjust it if you want a clean wave because of the transistor you're using. There are just slight differences in the transistor and you'll end up with slight differences in, in what you get. And the only thing left now to do is um, I might leave it just out or put it in a board or put it in a box or something. But I want to test this on the, uh, on the Grundig.
Eso. Hasta que tú no puedas moverlo, que tú rotes así tú. Tú lo pongas así. Tú lo pones en la misma. Oye, que te comenta. Los europeos. Bueno, pues ahora sí como el Morubanda. Hola, Manola. Se nota, es más, sí, sí. Es bueno, tiene razón el de Santiago, ¿no? Hay que ponerlo los dos en la misma orientación. So what have I done? I put it into a uh, enclosure, of course. And which one did I use? Well, the SMD version, of course. So this was just a uh, Hammond box. I think it's one of the smaller ones. I know it's one of the smaller ones. And um, you'll notice that the tune and level are the other way around because this is actually reversed. I'll show you in a second on the inside. The high-low, I decided to use a double pole, double throw switch. And this goes high. Remember I told you that you can switch between one and the other, and this goes low. But you'll also notice there's a light going on, and in the middle it's off. See that? So what I've got is a battery in here, and I've used the other pole, or the other, um, yeah, the other pole of the switch as a power switch for the battery that's in there. But then there's also a external jack where you can connect the 12 volts, and this is wired internally so that when you do connect the 12 volts, it disconnects the battery. So again, the 12 volt is on, it works. If I leave it on and remove this, it stays on because the battery is now taken over. So here we have it. Let me take the bottom off and show you. The battery actually stays vertically, and uh, when I put the lid on, it doesn't let it fall over, which is great. It just fits right. And what have I got here? Well, I've got the two pots coming out, of course. And um, as I mentioned, this is actually in reverse because we're seeing it this way up. So uh, that is our level. And that is our tune. The switch is on here. Double pole, double throw, as mentioned. There's a, um, a LED, ultra bright LED on, on here which just gives us an indication of whether it's on or off. So it'll come on whether I've got it on low or on high. And I know that the middle position of the switch is off. That's just to save battery. When you don't have an indicator, you in, in, inevitably or invariably, your battery drains. So everything is accessible. And I've got the, uh, the output coming to this um, BNC. Not that you really need a BNC, but it's just a very convenient way of uh, breaking it out. And that's it, my friends. This one is my equivalent, <laughs> not quite, my version of uh, the equivalent to the Zusatz 2000 to use on the, uh, on the Grundig. Now, this is not only to use on the Grundig. This thing works on any AM radio that uh, picks up the amateur bands. And I've actually tried it with uh, a real rough and ready tube amp uh, tube radio that I've got here that has um, three, is it three? Yeah, three shortwave bands. And I can pick up the 20 meters and the 40 meters fairly well. Um, it's, uh, there's no fine tuning on there, so you've got to be very, very, very accurate. And um, it works fairly well as well. In that particular case, in the case of the tube radio, I actually have to connect the ground to the ground and then the, uh, 
the RF signal to the antenna, and usually it works better on high. It's just because of the probably the um, more stringent uh, IF traps that it's got on there. So that's it, friends. That's my um, external BFO. And what I have done uh, for this one and for the uh, through-hole version, which I haven't forgot, forgotten, is I've shared them on PCB, PCBWay's website. So you can just um, you can download, download the Gerbers or you can just use them to make your own boards. I've also got a link in the description below that uh, links to a set of Gerbers on my server, on Google Drive, I believe it is. And it also has a small description, the schematic and description. So all the information is there. No excuses for not decoding SSB. So once again, I want to thank you. I want to thank PCB Way for sponsoring the video. Very kind of them. And I want to thank you for uh, watching the series. It's been quite a, a journey. Um, and I do certainly hope that you've enjoyed it. If you have, please click like and uh, share the video on social media. It does help get the views up. And of course, if you get the views up, uh, YouTube starts recommending it more often and so on and so forth. But as I said, I really do hope you've enjoyed this. And if you want to uh, support the channel directly, you can do so on Patreon. The uh, links are in the description below and at the end of the video. So once again, thanks for watching. Bye for now and stay safe.